here's the awesome like quantum physics thing is that the environment is changed and impacted by the watcher and the observer. So if you are holding a reality that's trauma-based, you're manifesting that reality. And it's not bypassing it reality because you can leave your house and you can experience the world and create programs and talk to people and be a powerful change agent. Or you can sit on the couch and be on your phone and be influenced by everyone around you and, and the fear that will come at you from those places that you're magnified. All right, Candice, back again on the Soul Seeker podcast. So stoked to have you. This is either the third or fourth time you've been on the show. And we're going to get right into talking about Akashic Records, fear, death, what happens after you die, all the things. Candice, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Yeah, I feel like it's a juicy topic. It's a question I get asked a lot in my work with clients, especially those in like active grieving, but also in people who are experiencing like many forms of death and transition in their life. So I think it's a cool spiritual topic and one that will be really relatable to a lot of your listeners. Absolutely. So I'm just going to hand it over to you because, you know, we were, we've been talking for a couple of years now about doing these interviews more regularly. And, you know, finally we're making some traction because it's episode 197 and the last one's 190. Mm -hmm. And when we talked about this one, you know, you brought up these these concepts. So I'm just going to hand it over to you to speak on whatever's coming through, and then we'll do our thing going back and forth. And yeah, let us uh, go ahead. Yeah, so this is yours. Let's do some like active channeling around this too. I think that might be cool and spontaneous. So I'm gonna like just take a minute and just connect in deeper to my own Akasha field, and that might be like a nice time for wherever you are, if you're listening to this, to like take a couple deep breaths and connect into yourself. Because the awesome part about listening to podcasts and, you know, listening to people and interacting in community is that we get to share energy with people. So, you know, this isn't just like listening to information. It's about like energetic upgrades. So I feel like let's take a moment to like center ourselves to do that. And then as we all do that, I'm going to open the Akasha and we'll work in tandem with them to talk about maybe a message or a group of messages that would be really useful for for everyone today around like dealing with transition and loss. So just give me a moment. Just take a few breaths. Mm. Such a delicious pause to be in silence, to be in connection with our, ourselves, such a foreign way that we may exist regularly. I have the Akashi Record Keepers here and present, and they're showing up to answer questions. There's this awareness of experiencing an uncensored mind and how foreign that is. An uncensored mind is a mind that is pure, creative, and flow without structure, not obsessing over pain or fear of the past or impending pain or fear of the future. And that loss is embedded in a lot of those fears. And as we sit with this awareness of like the uncensored mind, we can show up with like pure potential. We can show up with access to any bit of knowledge in the universe, any bit of knowledge from God consciousness, any bit of knowledge from our past lives, from our higher self and our inner wisdom. So the Akasha says that really, uh, um, this is so interesting. I wasn't expecting this, that the experience with loss is more deeply supported in the world when we have a deeper connection to the unstructured, uncensored mind, because then we can just be in pure emotion or pure like present momentness. Although it is, it's, it is even more than that, because what is presently coming up for us is often a lot of processing in these moments of loss, when we lose like a loved one or we lose a job or we lose a relationship or we lose like an outcome that we're expecting, there tends to be a lot of grief in that. And this process of being unstructured and being uncensored means you just let whatever is raw be, but you also like aren't dragging the past into the present moment. So we can certainly talk about that where people go when they transition. We can certainly talk about the healthy ways we might transition and deal with loss. But what's really cool, I think, in this moment is like the awareness of how can we have a mindset that cultivates more healing for transition? How can we have a mindset that 
opens the door for graceful loss. Not words that typically go together, graceful loss. Loss is something that every soul experiences. They experience it multiple times in this life. It's the root of a lot of trauma and a lot of past lives when I'm reading the Akasha. And loss shows up in many forms. And we have many of us live in obsessive, unhealthful ways, attempting to avoid loss even now. So really, we can explain it. We can help people feel more comfortable with it by understanding it logically. But truly, how we get better at loss is by working with uncensored mind and working with unstructured minds. And I think that that's something that would be interesting for us to talk about today a little bit more as well. So let me pause there and give you some space to respond to that maybe and ask some questions. Yeah, I've heard you say before, like normalizing death. And that's something that you do with your kids as well. And I think this is so, so crucial. And for me, it's interesting in my journeys with medicine over the past four years, like I almost feel a disconnection of being like afraid to die because I went through a period there, especially during the lockdowns where, you know, I felt ready. And I remember you and I connected at some point about a NACO. I remember seeing you yeah. NACO and I was really getting into NACO. And there was a song, I believe it's called Aloha Keakua. You're- yes. Right. Oh gosh, love that song. Mm-hmm. It's in it's I'll put it in the show notes. I'll make a note now to remember to do that so you guys can check it out if you're not familiar with it. But I remember around that time I would listen to that song all the time. And I went through probably at least a year period of being ready. You know, not not like a, a suicidal mm-hmm. point of view, but just like feeling like I've done everything that I've wanted to do, which I know now is like a very wild statement to say, I've known, I know I've done everything I want to do in this human experience, but I was also, you know, feeling hopeless, like the, the world, you know, all the spiritual people that I was being newly exposed to are saying the world is waking up and this is before the pandemic really. And then the pandemic kind of showed, oh yeah, it is. And it's taken, you know, the past few years to integrate all this, to be a different place with it. But even still, like, I'm not afraid of death, you know, for myself. I think the part that I struggle with is, fortunately, I haven't had anyone close to me die in recent years. And I really haven't had a lot of death around me. So it's easier to say versus embodiment. So I think there really is a bit of spiritually bypassing there of me saying I'm not afraid of death in terms of others. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think that's a great point. We have different relationships with our proximity to death. And I hear you speaking about it exclusively through like the like departing of the human form. And I think that's a huge part of how we connect with it. But I, I think, you know, I hear the Akasha also say that people are experiencing relationship with death every day. Right. Like as the as the clock ticks, we're experiencing some form of death because we're leaving a time space that we're no longer going to return to in this embodiment. And we are in opportunities or we're, we're, we have relationships that are changing. We, you know, we have relationships with our children that are growing up and changing, like all of these things, like evolution and itself is a form of loss, I think. Yeah. So like. How can we not spiritually bypass that? I think we can be attentive to the ways that loss is showing up now. And, and sometimes when we are spiritually bypassing loss from like a, perhaps a single perspective, like death of human form, when we actually experience loss in another way, it's completely jarring and our soul doesn't know how to cope with it mm. because we aren't actually engaging with loss as a consistent practice, a spiritual practice. Right. Uh, obviously surrender is coming through. What is Buddhism teach about death because you you are a Buddhist and you yes. know much so much more than me. So I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I mean, I would say I'm a Buddhist student. I don't think I'd I'd go so far in any sorry ask me to say I'm a Buddhist teacher, but that's cool. I'll, you know, I I I think, you know, it's like a lifelong thing too, right? Like it's a lifestyle of practicing non-attachment. It's a lifestyle of working with basic sacred tenets like the world is is here. We're here to experience in lots of ways pain. We're here to understand that nothing is permanent. You know, I think that on the whole, Buddhism may feel dreary on the first take of it, or it may feel like overwhelming emotionally, but I think it's really practical. And it's been such a powerful tool in my practice and therapy and in groups of people to like bring them closer to this awareness. Because when we can be more connected to this idea that everything is always changing, 
nothing stays the same. And to engage people in their relationship with attachment, we begin to realize how our identities and our happiness have been outsourced through these attachments to relationship and material. And when that forges over long periods of time, naturally, because we are meant to find God consciousness and wholeness within, we will lose those things. And then when we lose those things, we have like a dozen eggs that we've given out, you know, and then they all break. And then who are we? Then we're like on death's door of like our own mental health breakdown, right? Because it's like, oh, I didn't realize that could happen, right? And that can happen in many ways, not just, you know, the death of someone you love, but like the unexplained change of a job or in, in, in hundreds of other ways. So Buddhism teaches the expectation of this and teaches skills around compassionate attachment, embodiment of awareness, and like engaging in like meditation practices for single pointedness and activation of, of our motivations around our ego and like filling the holes that we tend to fill things with through escapist or addictive practices. So I love Buddhism in that way. And I've shared this story before, but I feel like we go through life in ways where we're just like consistently living and we're not appreciating. And when you really sort of get on the other side of, hey, nothing's permanent, everything changes, we get we can actually appreciate the present moment so much more than we do because we most of us just run through the day and we're not actually understanding that this moment is lost, that this moment is gone. So in this moment, if I were to sit here and be like, wow, I'm never going to pass this way with you again. We get to do it right now. It's, it's like delicious and special and juicy and, you know, like emotionally connected and powerful. Like this is a moment that we don't get back. And when we say it like that, there's like a sense of engagement. I feel like there's a sense of embodiment that shows up where two hearts or two minds can really like really appreciate one another. How much of us, especially with like our smartphones and our technology, we're just like moving like zombies through these moments that will never pass again. So the downside, I think, of Buddhism is the hard, hard reality of what is. And the upside is the opportunity to practice deep gratitude for the moment that is fleeting. Mm. Yeah, it's beautiful. And I mean, that that it really is the work. You know, I've been thinking about a lot recently in terms of like what doing the work means and what shadow work means and what the inner work means and all this other stuff. And it's really inviting it all in and sitting with it. What's, what I've been sharing with so many people is something I learned in your private container that I'm in, which I'm loving. And that is, thank you. Is there more? And I'm here for this. So it's been so powerful for me as I've been at the time of this recording going through a six week, well, I'd like to say conscious uncoupling, but the truth is it's a breakup. You know, I'm doing my best to handle it in a healthy, embodied, divine masculine. But as I sit with it and reflect really before bed, that's really just lying there with my eye mask on, you know, no, no psychedelics or anything like that, but just <laughs> reflecting maybe some cannabis, you know, to help. But uh, thank you. Is there more than yeah. sitting with it? And when it gets too tough, putting my left palm on my heart, feeling my heartbeat, heartbeat and my right palm on my belly, knowing that I'm safe yeah. and I'm here for this. The, the, I'm here for this stacked with thank you. Is there more has been so beneficial for sure. Oh, Sam, that's so awesome to hear. And I'm so glad to hear that the space that I'm offering you outside of our relationship in this way has been really nourishing. And I feel like what the element of what you're saying there is that, which is such a powerful underlying unspoken theme, is I am meant to be here now. Mm -hmm. Everything you just said are shorter ways to really embody and feel this idea that I am meant to be here now. Think about how much suffering happens in the world from our desperate attempt to resist what is. 100%. And loss, right? Give it back, bring it back, control, make it stop, prevent it from happening. Like everything we do in so many ways is about resistance. The idea of the unstructured mind and the uncensored mind is also like activation of like acceptance of the present moment as well, you know, what the Akasha was bringing through. So not that it makes the pain of any loss easier, but it allows us to actually be present with the energetic that wants to be known, that wants to be learned from, that wants to inspire our soul growth. 
we actually have the free will to avoid our stuff. People do yeah. it every day. And then we accumulate so much drama and karma as a result of that avoidance. And then it just keeps coming back around and slapping you in the face, dressed up as a slightly different, you know, experience. And that's why I love the Akashic field because it's just like, here's what the work is. Let's be present with it. And those words are words that I think are a call to action for people who are seeking or for people who the pain of their pain is like greater than the pain of change, right? Like the people who are scared to change, who are now like ready to change because their pain is larger. It's a call to action. But a lot, for a lot of people, this sort of work is like run the other way, mm -hmm. like turn and run, right? Like I don't want to face that. I'd much rather like take substances, be on social media, oh my have God. a lot of like yeah. distracting relationships. Like I don't want to deal with this. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, in a second, I'd love to get into the energetics of March, 2023, because this is something that we can come back to years from now. But before we do, another song came through a little bit ago when you were talking, Everything Changes by Soja. You know that one? Okay. Yeah. Oh my God. So luckily I got into Soja maybe like, I don't know, five months ago or so. And and yes. six weeks ago, I really got into them around the time that all this started at time recording April 4th. So, you know, for me, things started to turn upside down right before March started. And I would listen to a lot. They have such mindful and deep spiritual lyrics. And uh, on the full, no, no, the new moon in March, I did like just, you know, a very intuitive, playful new moon ceremony. I had every intention to to have a dance party, to release this stuck energy and kind of have it be light and, and playful and fun. And I put on the song, Everything Changes, which I had probably listened to at least 50 times in the past few weeks. And for whatever reason, that time it took me to my knees in my kitchen and I started crying and I, and I, it's hard for me to let tears go through for as much work as I've done. I'm still like that guy that has the armor that, you know, one small tear, but I let it all go. And it was so cathartic in those lyrics. And I'll put this in the show notes as well of everything changes. Like it is wow. so beautiful. I think the, there's, I want to say beauty in the disaster. Is that maybe a lyric or name of the album or something? But it's so true, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, it, it's, I, so just to like nod to what you're saying is that the astrology of, of March and really the astrology of this remainder of this year is positioning us to surrender more into the self-work, the shadow work, the personal work. You know, Saturn represents the authoritarian parent. Saturn's like the energetic of, if you clean your room, I'll give you 20 bucks. Well, if you only clean it partially, Saturn's like, yeah, no dice for you, right? So like if there's a sense of measurement and hardship and discipline. There's a slow moving energetic there. I think that's probably a very shadow aspect to describe Saturn. Saturn can also be described as things like, like things that we know we should do, but we don't all love doing, like going to the dentist and cleaning out our closet. But it is the part of us that keeps us to discipline. It's the part of us that reminds us of where we've forgotten to like clean or peek or address areas of our life. I have a great relationship with Saturn. I have a Capricorn rising. It's ruled by Saturn. And I just feel like part, a lot of me is very disciplined in a lot of ways. And so like, I think we all have to like lean into what our relationship is like with that archetype of do the work. If we avoid that, if we run from that, if we're cool with that, if we're overly engaged in it, I know I have an overdrive of that where I need to like be easy, give myself permission and grace. This might be a good question for everybody here today as well, given what this topic of like, what's my relationship with this archetype of discipline and work? Well, Saturn's going into Pisces for, for three years. It's already happened. And, you know, Pisces is surrender, spirituality, emotion, mysticism, an unconscious, poetic way in which we understand life. So like the work of Saturn is now in this sign. So the, how we navigate our, our karma, which Saturn often represents, is through the world of the spiritual lens or the personal growth. So I think that's really relevant right now for a lot of us. And I think people have been also reporting to me like a sense of deeper emotional access, like almost like surprisingly. So like, hey, what's happening in the world? 
anything out there happening in the stars? Because I'm like feeling really emotional. Well, like the work is bringing us to what we may have not already addressed that we now need to address. The work is now. What, what, what we've been maybe successful in addressing is no longer available. And coming back to this theme of death, like, you know, and you mentioned this earlier, like it's not always the physical vessel, you know, like it's Absolutely. mostly it's not. Yeah. Could you speak to that specifically a bit? Yeah. So, you know, death means like a change of values, a change in our relationships with physical people, a ending of a certain way of living or thinking, especially with Saturn here, it's almost like things you thought that were, might be true about yourself and an end or a change to that. Like, you know, there's insight that's related to this. I think also our relationships with money, our relationships with the material world. And, you know, I would say for anyone who's like being, wants to be curious about how's loss showing up for me, look at what tends to create the most anxiety and emotional trauma for you pattern-wise and how the universe is tinkering with that. You know, the Akasha says that where you give your power gets, gets messed with or gets taken away. Not because someone is over there like reading a crystal ball and laughing and eating popcorn just to torture you, yeah. but because it's a misguided direction of your God source energy. And that can because be- Because God source energy- Oh, go ahead. No, because God's source of energy is about us, if it were here, to define that, to connect to that, to become one with that. So when you're giving that away to people or money or jobs, it doesn't live there. It's like sending our true essence out into the world. The universe is just going to come back to us, right? That's not going to be a stable ground for our power source, right? Like your power is a person, your power is money, your power, your identity is a job. That's going to go away. That's going to be messed or tinkered with because you are manifesting that because that's not where our power belongs. Our power belongs within, home within us. So those things get shaken up as a way to send the power back home to you for you to reconcile that. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. The, the part I want to unpack a little bit more is the statement, giving your power away, because that can be something if you're not, if you're new to hearing something like that, like what exactly does it mean to give yeah. your power away in those scenarios that you mentioned? Yeah. Thanks for that. Right. Because sometimes the way I, I, I think and speak sometimes is not always in alignment with like how everyday speak is. So I'm the bridge, I, right? You're the bridge. I appreciate yeah. you so much there. Yeah. So, I mean, we can use some Buddhist terms, right? Point of attachment could be a way we give our power away, a way in which we seek validation, identity, and approval. The way that we tend to put lots of time and energy into something that we are having expectations or a tie to some kind of outcome as well mm. would be another form of that. We'd be so, looking at that. Yeah, I think that's a good rule of thumb if there's expectations involved. Yeah, I think like, here's a good question. If I let go of this thing in my life, who am I? Codependency right answer, there. And if you can't answer that question, that means you've given your power away to that thing because your identity is wrapped up in it. Yeah. What's interesting about identities is I got to a place where I really felt strict of a lot of identities and roles. And like, that's the aim for a lot of people on the spiritual journey, you know? And then sure. through this last six months or so of life changes, getting into relationship and things like that, I piled on all of these identities, you know? So it's really interesting to see like how things have shifted. And, you know, I, I encourage anyone listening to go to the show notes and click the link that says Candace's March predictions, because I probably listened to that about 10 times myself. And you would think that after listening to it at least 10 times myself, sending it to, you know, at least 30 people and, you know, saying to my mom 10 times and being like, have you listened yet? And she still doesn't listen, you know, <laughs> shout out to you, mom. We'll watch it together <laughs> soon. But yeah, you think that I would be able to articulate this for myself, but if, for whatever reason, like a lot of the energetics and the astrological stuff, like I, I'm having so much trouble retaining the information. So from like a big picture, what do people need to know about this turning point and what it means for like the next 20 years or how long the cycle yeah. is? 
Yeah, I mean, so astrology is archetypal, right? It's it's their consciousness. There's consciousness in all things. Everything is made up of atoms and particles, and you know, not to get too sciencey here, but I've been super into that lately. And it's like this: we're created, we're all made of the same stuff. And so these planetary movements, they're large bodies of consciousness, and they're moving around, and we're interacting with that container. So we can make it really simple and say that. But like what it means for us in the next 20 years, right? So Pluto is moving into Aquarius. That's a big buzz. If you're into astrology, that's not happened in the last 20 years. It's a new initiation. And we're going to be seeing that really in the next three months, a lot there. And then it will kind of retrograde. Each, it goes back to where it came from. And then it goes forward again in Aquarius in January. So what does that mean? It means that we are here to work with change and evolution and transformation and death. Because Pluto means birth and death. Our relationship with transformation and birth and death needs to embody a more Aquarian mindset. And the Aquarian mindset is about, you know, among many things I think really interesting is there's a detachment associated with Aquarius. There's a detachment. I think that's a strong element. It's not the only element, but for our discussions today around loss, our relationship with things is less obsessive, right? Less I focus, ego focus. It has a sense of the watcher and the observer. It also means that we work together with people and we're, we're conscious of how we're showing up and how that relates to others. So like, I think in terms of grief and loss and the way we attach to things, like we can practice relationship with conne- connection and with other people who are doing spiritual work. That might be a great use of this energy. Pluto is an outer planet. This also means systemic and social change. So we are going to see this in the community as well. We're going to see change, perhaps radical change, perhaps aggressive change on, on, on levels of systems like political, financial, health, like fields, for sure. There's going to be evolution around technology. There's going to be opportunities for us. And the Akash has been talking about this as well when I'm channeling, like, be mindful of looking the other way in, in, in situations where you're highly, highly triggered, because there's going to be a trigger within you that needs to be taken good care of and worked on. And if you don't take good care and work, on that, you might project your trauma onto the collective and onto other people, in which case you're just reliving your trauma over and over and you're in a trauma loop and you're not actually addressing it. So the people, this is powerful, people on the front lines, people that are creating projects and things tend to be people who have consciousness of why this is happening in this change. And they have systems for, for that and vehicles for that, for others to walk down. If you are highly electrified by what you're seeing in the world, you need to take care of yourself first. I want us to think about it like a battle. If there is blood shooting out of your arm, you can't just keep going into battle. You just stop and take care of your wound first. And then you're like, okay, now what? And what do I have to contribute? And how have I learned? So like, it's not about not looking at the, what the world's doing. It's about prioritizing self-care. It's about prioritizing the work that your soul wants to do in the face of these changes, in the face of the losses that you're experiencing. And this could happen on a micro level with the breakup. This could happen on a macro level, like watching something on TV and having a full response to it. The work is always with us. The work is always with us. And when you do that work, what then comes naturally without effort is inspiration on how we may want to serve the world from our medicine place, which I think you're a great reflection of. When I first met you many years ago, you were not fully immersed in the spiritual work. And now you are because you did that work yourself. And then there was an eagerness and an energetic that said, I want to now teach, speak, do in all the ways that you have. It comes naturally. Then we create a bridge for others. I think we can get really messy in societally when everybody is showing up, projecting their trauma onto each other. So nobody can actually hold space for the trauma because people are just throwing their own knives at each other. There's no resolution. Pluto and Aquarius is about working together. It's about we the people. So I'm excited for it. Like that's the popcorn moment for me. Like I want to see what we the people do. You know, I said to my husband the other day, I'm like, oh man, like there's all this political stuff happening and probably going to be some conflict there. And he's like, I'm here for it. Whatever it takes, yeah. system to change. And I was like, you know what? I'll go to you. Like, I'll go to you, right? Like whatever it takes for the system to change. We get to be alive now. That's chosen mindset. Not everybody thinks that. Some people are like, dear God, why am I alive now? I don't want to bring any children into the way the world is right now. Some people have that perspective as well. But like, it's amazing to be alive now, to be part of that. And I would say, take good care of yourself in the process. That's the most important thing in summary. Preach. Love it. Okay. So unpacking it a bit more. So Pluto is in Aquarius. Pluto is a planet that represents transformation, death, right? 
Yes. And Aquarius is a sign. What I yes. don't know the answer to this. Like, what does what does that mean? Is it like a star constellation? What does that even mean? Yeah. So the so the placement of the planets that move and revolve around the sun. There's a certain Pluto moves exceptionally slow. So it takes 20 years for it to move through a sign astrologically, mathematically in the sky. It was in Capricorn previously. Capricorn is associated with like independent systems, government systems, like the birth of um, like digital coin and all of these things were kind of happening around Pluto in Capricorn. Aquarius is, it has a very disruptive energy. Like the Aquarian people are outside of the box thinkers. They're like associated in astrology with like aliens and being into like, the undercurrents of life. So to have Pluto there means like, I think there's a deeper spiritual awakening coming. People are starting to think more. People are going to start pushing the boundaries more. We're already seeing this. This is not a light switch. It's not like yesterday we weren't there and today we are. I mean, I'm much more accepted in my work now more than ever. And it wasn't just because of March, 2023. In the last three years, this has been an initiation energetically of this energy. There's more people who or stepping in and breaking the rules and looking at things creatively and meshing worlds together that haven't been meshed. That's really Pluto in Aquarius. Yeah. And in, in 2019 of March, March of 2019, I should say, is when I felt like I was being called and when I was activated. And in hindsight, like when we were in the lockdowns, I started to meet a lot of people that were activated in 2018 and 2019. And it, it made a lot yeah. of sense. It was like, oh, preparing for the lockdowns and more lighthouses, more people doing the work. It seems to me now that not just like this period we're in now, but this next 20 year period is going to be a big activation of awakenings. Is that kind of what I'm hearing from you? No, the image in my head in the Akasha is a bunch of people at a start line to run a marathon, like kicking their heels, ready to run. Okay. It's like, we're ready for it. We're here for it. Let's do it. Right. And, and there's, a, there's a reason why the image of that is a group of people, because that is very Aquarian, right? It's like, go together. Let's run. Let's do it. So I think there's initiations and there, there's projects that are going to have full realization in the next 20 year period. What's cool about this placement now is it goes here for three months. So we're getting a preview to the movie in the right. next three months. So from March to June, I'm like with my popcorn, like on the news, like what's going on in the world? You know, it's really cool. Actually, you know, even in France, France French Revolution was the last time Pluto was in Aquarius for, during the, like the major revolution. And actually our industrial revolution, our tech revolution was in this country was the last time Pluto was in Aquarius. I mean, I think you know, AI and all the places the metaverse is going, we're going to have, a, that's a whole other conversation, but that's also what's going to initiate now. What's really cool is also what's happening in France is that there's major confrontation there around labor laws and lots of like protesting right now, which is the exact same point that Pluto was in when it was last in this position in that country. So I, what I like about Pluto, which people can be really scared of in astrology, Pluto, you know, if, if Saturn, gives you orders and, and, and pays you for a job well done because it wants you to work. Pluto checks your work. Pluto checks your work. Pluto says, how well did you do this? And if you haven't, time for some death, time for some transformation, time for some, some jolt. Historically, Pluto has never changed a sign and not had some systemic big change. The last time Pluto, when Pluto went into Capricorn, the market crashed in 2008. So in the next three months, we're getting a preview of what's likely to happen. And then it's going to go back into Capricorn for the rest of the year, which I think gives all of us an opportunity, like little busy ants to run back to the home and say like, what do I want to build? What do I want to become? How do we want to change? And we're going to gear up for that. It's almost like a prep. And then when it moves in more formally in January, it'll be there permanently for the next 20 years. And I think that's when the things will start to change. Pluto invariably, invariably has death written on it. It has so on it. during the lockdowns, you know, and kind of similar to what you said about your husband, Brian, maybe not, but just what I heard, at least when we started to come out of the lockdowns and things started to go back to like normal ish, I was feeling like, no, let him burn. You know, like, I don't want like pull up the band aid. You know, that's kind of how I felt. I'm curious, like, because that was a lot of devastation for all of us in those years. And I mean, still is the aftermath, right? 
But as we enter this next 20 year cycle, is it going to be kind of like that or is it going to be a little bit more graceful and easeful, do you think? Yeah, well, I, I hear the Akasha saying depends on what level of consciousness you choose to live on. Depends on your relationship with death or it depends on your relationship with transformation. Because if that triggers a lot of fear, like, and you're responding from your trauma place, then yeah, good luck out there. It's not going to be fun, right? Because you, here's the awesome, like, quantum physics thing is that the environment is changed and impacted by the watcher and the observer of it. So you're creating the reality that you're watching. So if you are holding a reality that's trauma-based, you're manifesting that reality. So we want to be looking at how can we take good care of the trauma that is arriving and how are we choosing to interact with transformation that is around us? And I think it goes back to what you said, right? I'm meant to be here. So, you know, thank you. Is there more? Everything is happening for me and not to me. If that's truly your belief, then the world is happening for us. And we and, and that is going to be our reality. And it's not bypassing it reality because you can leave your house and you can experience the world and create programs and talk to people and be a powerful change agent. Or you can sit on the couch and be on your phone and be influenced by everyone around you and, and the fear that will come at you from those places that you're magnetizing and believe that that's the truth. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, it is a fine line of spiritual spiritually bypassing, I believe. And one thing that I, I have really felt into over these past few years is because I woke up, quote unquote, woke up, whatever that means to you, be activated, I like that terminology more, in 2019, the world around me woke up, right? You know, that's kind of like essentially what you're saying. And you know, I, I would love to, I love when it gets juicy because I would love to really challenge the idea that engagement in, you know, like in a certain point of, of like view is, is, is spiritually bypassing because the Akasha would say it's not. They would say like, we have, the reason why it's not is because you are participating in an embodied, engaged way with how you're experiencing the world. And who's to say that how you're experiencing it is better or worse or bypassing or engaged? Because I think we have an obsession, almost a Scorpio obsession to be bleeding all of our trauma into the world. And that's not healthy either. Sure. I think we can, if we are engaging and embodying what is, then it's not bypassing. Aging and embodying what it is. Yes, 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 yes. Right? Yes. So do we need to embody that from the from the rawest form of trauma? Do we need to go there? Because there is a there is a pull into that. Think about the powers that be and the puppet masters, whoever they may be, and the value of hysteria and fear in the world. There's a it's a currency, man. To get mm -hmm. people angry and scared and fired up. Like, look, if that's where you are, then take care of that wound. That's why the Akasha says step out of the battle when you're when you have a big wound, because you're not of right mind to be doing both. Take care of yourself. But if you're choosing to embody and engage a mindset in the way the world is is like in revolution, and you're engaging that, meaning you're creating work in the world that's serving that, that's not bypassing. Okay, Candice, I'm going to try to say this another way. Uh, and, and for anyone listening, it just let's all take a moment and pause how amazing it is that the movie Everything Everywhere All at Once won or multiple Oscars. You know, I didn't watch the Oscars, yes. but I watched the movie a few times last year when yes. it came out. And that goes to show like where our society is at. Having said that, I, I want to do some timeline discussions here because where I'm feeling into this right now is, and this is going to get really wooing out there. Let's have fun with this, right? Like the, All right. my version of Candace in my life, right? You know, your, your version of reality in the way you see things maybe is all love and light, rainbows and perfect. But since I'm still getting there, I don't think I'm explaining this well, but do you kind of understand? Oh, let me try another right. Because yeah. this is hard to explain, but. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm listening. Right. Like if quantum physics, and I've talked about it so many times at length and like the Rainmaker story as well, relating it to quantum physics. Like if the outer world that we experience with the five senses is a reflection of our inner world, and I believe that to be true, 
then why isn't yeah. everything just perfect, right? Well, the answer is that I don't have my inner world completely in order. So this is the world that I'm experiencing. So I'm experiencing the version of you that is here to help me lean into that and have more trust, faith, and surrender into that. But then the version of the world you're experiencing is so much more light, but in a different timeline. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. I mean, I have lots of questions, I think, for you around that. And the first one is, why is a goal to see the world as perfect and in peace to begin with? Because that feels like not possible. Right. And I don't know that I see, you know, I personally don't see the world as love and light. I think that other dimensional accesses don't have value base, right? So other dimensional ways in which we're viewing the world aren't value based or hierarchical at all. They're all existing in the same timeline. So like they're not better or worse than yours. They just are. And I think they all experience some form of density, probably, right? They have all experienced some form of reality. I think what happens is a natural urge to engage you know, in where what, what our eyes are seeing, what we're manifesting. I think what we're talking about here is people who are trying to be somewhere where they're not. Mm. And this might just be about like, what, like, where are you now? And what's the work you need to be doing within yourself? Because that will manifest in terms of the world that you're seeing naturally where you are. But trying to be somewhere you're not probably is going to be challenging or futile or not helpful. And that's when we come back. Thank you. Is there more? I'm here for this. It's yeah. And really like, well, if the outer world sucks, you know, then I need to do better on the inner world. I need to be, well, I, nice. I feel like, again, this might be an assumption that other dimensional access points are rainbows and butterflies and they're not. Mm. It's yeah. an assumption that there's some perfection there. Yeah. And I mean, perfect, you know, that's probably, it's right. Sometimes. Oh, uh, sure. Or, yeah, for sure. Okay, thank it's you. It's juicy. I like this. There's like some, there's like some back and forth happening here. I like it. This is how we grow, right? By questioning. Because I mean, yeah. if we believe in absolutes and this is the stuff, then we're not growing, right? And this, yeah, mm -hmm. these conversations are what feed my soul. That's why I started this podcast, right? Yeah. And I'm so, here for it too. Yeah, you're here for it. That's awesome. What else comes up before? Because I don't want to leave this prematurely. Is there anything more? that you can think of that we can speak on in terms Yeah, I think like we haven't talked about like which you brought up very, you know, very, I think poignantly is this idea of timelines, yeah. right? So like the Akasha says that we exit and enter timelines or have something called timeline merging spontaneously through our soul growth work. This can be initiated faster in time space or sooner in time space in 3D if we're like actively engaging in soul work. So timelines give us access to different insights, different ways of viewing, seeing, being in the world, kind of what we're just talking about now. Like I see the world that this is happening. Other people are going to see it very differently. I think the way that we support ourselves in evolving to different timelines is by being taking good care of the trauma that's present in us, that's being triggered in us by the outside world. You know, really like the goal here is neutrality. These other timelines don't mean the world is perfect. It means you're viewing the world from a different emotional center. You're viewing the world and engaging in the world from a different emotional center. There's greater neutrality in you. There's greater perhaps contribution or desire to participate or curiosity or interest. Maybe there's empathy, maybe there's sadness, but you personally aren't having your karma triggered by what the world is doing. That's the timeline evolution is about that. I think we're all here to have timeline evolution. No place is better than anyone else. I find though people who delay self-work tend to be like a snake skin pushed out of their timeline right? Like the snakes live in the skin, you can come in or you're not coming. And that can very much sometimes be, in the spirit of our discussion today, abrupt loss. Not always, but it can be abrupt loss. You know, I think timelines are like interesting. You know, in the Akasha, they said that they're all sort of simultaneously activated, but our 3D form has access to them based on the work that we're doing. So I think that's an interesting concept related to everything we're saying here today. Mm -hmm. It's a lot to sit with. <laughs> Some, sometimes when you talk, it, it's, what's that? Brains are burning now everywhere. Maybe whoever's listening. Or we'll yeah. listen. Sometimes when you talk, it's just so fast. There's so much coming through. I'm like, okay, we're processing, processing, <laughs> you know, like timelines. Okay. So 
I've had an experience and I, I recently watched the movie Fight Club again for the first time in like 10 years. And I'm going to be doing like a breakdown of the hidden spirituality of Fight Club like I did with Soul soon. And we all have seen the movie, most of us at least. You've seen it, obviously, right? You just Long knocked. time ago, but yes. Oh, it's a great one to revisit, especially and for me now as I'm processing my own loss and all of this and, you know, finding ways of sacred rage and looking at the movie of how that was not an expression of sacred rage, but they were on to something, right? You know, they were yeah. on to something. Shadow side, though. Having said that, there's the scene where Brad Pitt is uh, Tyler Dern. That's his character. He switches the film reel and then he puts a penis on it and no one sees it. You remember that? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. 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 And it's kind of, they talk about the film and how they cut it and like no one sees they saw it. I've seen, forget about the genitalia part of this, but, but with timelines, I've had this happen when I was really in the thick of my journey and experiencing 5D symptoms, if you will, where I kind of saw like the the flash of like, and then all of a sudden it felt like after the third or fourth time experiencing it, what it felt like when I tapped into my intuition was that flash. It wasn't lights or anything like that. You know, I mean, it felt like I was switching timelines. Mm. Like you could, yeah. So just to lean into that, sometimes what it feels like when you're switching timelines or accessing a timeline they happen simultaneously. They're all happening. So you can actually right. have transcendent experience is that you so you have a consciousness, a feeling, a state, a thought, a vision of like you being embodying a certain issue from a different perspective, perhaps from a different aspect, from a like a more cleared space. You can almost see yourself experiencing it differently. Sometimes that is an experience people have. Maybe they describe it like a flash or they have a moment of like, wow, I can see why this is happening. And it feels like this and this is the purpose. And then in the next minute, they're back in this like current 3D reality of maybe this dense timeline of where the grief is happening. And they have to be in that, right? Like they want, they need to be present for that and take good care of that. I think the biggest mistake here is that there is ways to really be connected to these processes and hold space for the dense emotion that is the present moment. I always, you know, I talk about that a lot. But it's not black and white, right? It's not like being in the present moment or bypass the present moment of pain. I think you can be in a timeline where things suck and things are hard and painful and you can have access to those other places. You know, the Akasha says that simultaneous awareness of both is really a powerful tool for evolution because then we are not the pain itself. We are not the story or the narrative itself that the actual capacity to hold space as the watcher for multiple timelines or even the current painful timeline you're in immediately positions you as a free agent in the spirit world. Quick you're time no longer check. Attached. How are you doing on time? Good. All right. Okay, sweet. Cool. Because we are in such a good flow here and we're planning yeah. on wrapping up in like five minutes. So I was actually two minutes. So I just want to make sure. Okay. So yeah, okay. On, on that vein, one thing I wanted to talk with you about the, is the watcher because yeah, I've heard you say this a lot recently being in your program and it reminds me of like Michael Singer's talking about like witness and observer yes. consciousness. And as I ask you that question, I'm going to bake this in with it as well. How do we explain the consciousness of say our higher self, our soul being plugged into not only different timelines of me as Sam, you as Candace, and you guys as the listener of your ego self in this time, in this incarnation with multiple timelines, but also concurrent parallel lives on and off of this planet. It's like, how do we explain? Is it the consciousness watcher? What is it? And how are we plugged into this one right now? And the other ones are happening simultaneously. Yeah. So the question I hear the question, the question itself is rooted in 3D because there's a deep desire to logically understand, which only happens in the human form. Right. So we will answer that as best as possible through that, although it is not possible to answer it logically. They said that by definition, the watcher has no identity. The watcher isn't attached. The watcher is everywhere, sort of the super conscious. God consciousness, you know, that represents your soul. And the watcher is, is, is in all places, as in all things. There is no tangible, concrete, 
uh, identity form of the watcher. The watcher is you, you know, the Akasha is saying like in your own Akasha field, sort of like looking down at all versions of you. Would that be your soul? Yeah, I would say that's a good explanation. I hear the Akash saying there's many other words that could probably be interchanged there, but there's a desire to label. There's a desire to have form. There's a desire mm. to understand in linear time space, which can't happen in this form. But so that's why this idea of the watcher is so profound for spiritual growth, because it, by definition, when we say like get out of the, the ego and just be the watcher, we're creating that instant experience of non-attachment. And it, it provides us uh, separation from the story, the narrative, the pain, the trauma. And then, you know, we do have to interact with that pain and trauma that's triggered in our form. But even that interaction is more conscious because we're like, wow, I'm interact. What does this pain want for me? And how can I support this pain? And how can I engage in, you know, like we are now watching and being in and actively choosing. How many of us are actively choosing engagement with what is arriving? I would say very little. I say most of us are unconsciously responding to the blood that's squirting out of that trauma moment. Unconsciously responding. We're not getting some space and actively being curious as the watcher what wants to be taken care of. What about, because I agree, but what about the amount of us that are quote unquote doing the work? What would you say the ratio is there? What do you mean like how much of us are? I, I think that it's not... It, I mean, we're in the human experience for a reason. We, you know, we're conscious in this form for obviously a reason and we need to be present in our body. And there's, we're not 100% of the time doing that. You know, I don't think I'm 100% of the doing it. But mm. you know what I do is I move out of it faster when I'm in the pain and like, okay, in the pain moment, here I am. In the pain, I'm not trying to run away from a pain moment. I know better that that's going to chase me down and tackle me, right? I don't want that. I don't want to be beaten up, you know, and, and tortured by avoided pain. So like be in pain moment in 3D self and hold space for the watcher who says, this may, you know, here I am in this moment that I'm here for it. I think there could be a, even for those of us who are doing the work, a mistake. Human mind says, why am I here? What's the lesson? How do I stop this? How do I make this not happen again? What's the pattern? There's a lot of, you know, mental masturbation for people who are in the spiritual work of really wanting to understand what it's about. And again, that's not going to fix it or heal it either. The consciousness emerges. You can't control the consciousness that emerges from your pain. You allow the, the pain to birth the consciousness by taking good care of it, by being present with it. The magic, the healing, the wisdom come from it. If you're watching it, you know it, you see it. In the moment of pain, the mind that says, why is this happening to me? It's just the mind that's escaping the pain. So if we are reframing, why is this happening to me to why is this happening for me or what's the lesson? We're still missing the boat, you're saying? Yes. Interesting. Be in the pain. Okay, okay. I'm watching the pain. I'm watching the pain. It sucks. It's painful. It's here in my body. It's here in my mind. It's showing up for me. Oh, it's, it's so uncomfortable. It's like wearing a pain coat. It's the ego that's being like, what's the lesson and this is happening for me. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. It's an yeah. eject. It's a, it's a, it's a, it, that's called, you know, that's great spiritual bypassing moment. It's eject the pain, eject from this pain moment. So where I'm going with this is there are a lot of false lights out there, whether it be leaders in spiritual leaders or just people quote unquote doing the work yeah. and I'm not calling them out or trying to cast judgment, but to your point, we don't even really understand it. You know, I, I feel like there's with there's a responsibility and a duty for, I've been really passionate about lighthouses recently, you know, and teaching my people that we are the lighthouses, the bridge, right? And it's for us to show up and, you know, the medicine is within you. You have all the answers to you and within you. And it's just about these different tools, modalities, practices, all of this to come back to those answers. And it's discouraging to me when I, so maybe there's a bit of judgment. Yeah. It's discouraging when we see a lot of these false lights. Yeah. I, I've talked about this recently on another podcast and I swear we have some righteousness that my ego shows up in as well, because there's a high degree of integrity that I try to have around my work. And it is, it is, can be discouraging when you see others in this way, but I've sort of gotten to this point as well. And the Akasha has really helped me with it. When I've checked in with my own Akasha about that is like, Pay no mind to the man behind the curtain, right? Wizard of Oz. Like, pay no mind. Like, 
though those energetics are are participating on the planet in the ways that they think is best and they're going to attract people who are vibrating at a level in which that medicine feels right for them and if they're attracted to that then there's some contract there for them to experience an exchange and who am i to like run up into that business and like teach them a lesson like that's not up to me that's not the story that i want to be living that that's going to be futile i know that we're you're saying we do that but it helps me to realize like contractually there's mission and there's attraction for people to certain teachers. The Akasha describes it as a river that's fast moving and that there's lots of people on this river moving fast. And there's no place on the river that's better or worse than any other. We're all going to go to the same place. We're all here to just develop spiritually. And at some point we decide, okay, this this sucks tumbling in this river without any support. So we look to the shore and there's a teacher there. And the teacher magically appears based on where we are in the river. And that teacher may be by our, our standards, more bold, less evolved, more ego, less ego, doesn't matter. If you're looking to the shore and you're attracted to that leader, then that's who you are. That's where you are. So for me, it's about loving and trusting and serving powerfully the people who find me on the river and also letting myself continue to evolve on in my own river and reaching out to people who can support me. And when people move through me and from me, that I'm not attached to that either because I know they'll go on to other people that maybe they need support from. And that helps me to be less attached to that ego piece. Okay, thank you for that. And there's something you mentioned there, and this will be the last topic about we're all here to spiritually advance. So this is the big question. What happens after we die? Well, life review happens. Life review is not like how certain biblical- Like in the movie Soul. Yes, yes. There's there's a there's a sense of 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 exploration and review. The Akasha does say that we experience the world uh through the through the empathy of everyone we we touched or interacted with. So we actually have an empathic response watching how we interacted with everybody. So we feel what they would have felt based on how we treated them or engaged them. So, so that, as you can imagine, is huge. Yeah, you know. I saw Matias De Stefano speak a, a few years ago, and I, I might be getting this wrong, or I might have heard it wrong and remembered it wrong. But with that said, the way I understood him, what he said was, as soon as you die, you come back into Earth. And that doesn't resonate with me because, yeah, yeah. So I'd love for you to speak to that piece of it. Yeah. So it's very, it's a very intimate individualized process according to the akasha some many souls go through this life review experience and then they like it's almost like an incubation sometimes when i work with channeling and connect with souls on the other side they're like in this like etheric incubation on a soul like on a soul level almost like this beautiful little egg that's the vision there's that's not physical but that's the that's the visual the symbol and their soul is like assimilating integrating with what the consciousness has developed, what still may want more integration and support and how contribution wants to be supported. And then there's a sense of like plotting entry back in to time, space, condition, and contracts that would continue to evolve that. Of course, there is no time, space over there. So in our heads, we think, oh, we're waiting over there in some incubation, but that's not how it works. It feels like it's real time all the time. So that statement by that person may be partially true. That may be the process. That's not how time space actually works. It's not actually immediately because there's still a process that's happening that's individualized based on each soul. But our time space standards, it could be like the next generation or it could be thousands of years. On the other side, it may feel instantaneous. But that process sometimes also doesn't manifest in reincarnation on this planet. It may manifest energetically on other time spaces in other galaxies and other universes. That was the main piece of it for me because that's the part where it's like, no, I don't feel like that we keep coming back to Earth because if time doesn't exist, what's that? Earth is by far not the only place of conscious life. Um, Oh, well, you know, I know that. How many times have we talked about aliens? (laughs) (laughs) For sure that. But my yeah, you know, For sure. I don't feel like, and again, this is the ego trying to understand and we can't really to a certain extent, but if we believe in earth being a master class and a place to evolve as a soul and you ascend into higher dimensions. And if someone like myself, I would 
identify, to use an identity, be a star seed to be here as a yeah. volunteer, if you will. It's like, no, this is beyond that. And even if I didn't identify as a star seed and, you know, identified with Dolores Cans type stuff of being all the elements and everything else, and then, you know, working your way through the animal kingdom, then be a human and then go through all your karma. No matter what, eventually you're going to ascend to other dimensions. Well, you know, the Akasha just corrected me. They said, who said there's only one, one life being lived in one dimension at one time? Timelines. Who, right. So who said there's only one life being lived in one dimension at one time? They said, we're living in all dimensions, in all time space, in all galaxies, simultaneously. Right? 100%. Simultaneously. So this idea of reincarnation is faulty in some ways because it means like the one soul and only coming back to earth is like the process when we're actually simultaneously right now, you're also somewhere else in another time space, not on earth in your own star galaxy, living your best life. Who knows what you're doing over there, right? Like yeah. that's happening also. So if we're, if we have embodied consciousness now, the juicy question is, what am I here now to be doing, experiencing, growing, and, you know, teaching? Because if we're here now, there's something about it that our soul wants to have. And but all, that entire experience is happening simultaneously. It's not a one life and then you go over there and you come back to only this life. No, it's all happening right now. They actually told me in the Akasha, stop saying the phrase past life. Yeah. They want me to say concurrent, concurrent lifetimes, concurrent, concurrent species, concurrent race. I think it depends who you're talking to. If they're new to it, past life. And if you're deep in it, then concurrent or pair oh, up, right? That's true. Yeah. I, that's true. I actually modulate my my language based on the readiness, availability, access point of the people mm -hmm. I talk to for those reasons as well. But yeah. 100%. We deeper. All right. Last question. This can be for the Akashic Records. So the movie, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, I had to watch it a few times before I liked it because I get really stuck in my Taurus ways, if you will, and my stubbornness, right? And I was like, no, this isn't alternate universes. This is alternate timelines. So what does the Akasha have to say about that? I mean, they said it's true. I mean, it's true, right? Like, we, we already know that we're living alternate timelines right now. We actually experience our trauma from this, from this life actively right now where we're experiencing, where we're living and experiencing. That's an example of proof of alternate timelines. We can, we can call, call it to memory right now. And, and just to further the point that, cause some people might be listening, be like alternate universe. What does that mean? I wouldn't believe that the ego of yourself and the ego of me would exist outside of this universe, which is why my point is it's alternate timelines within this universe, right? Well, there's more than one universe. Exactly. But like the the human version of Candace, the human version yes. of Sam, like that is in this universe. It wouldn't exist outside of this universe. The soul does, but the ego, the person doesn't, right? The form, yes. The form and, and the memory. But like the Akash is even saying that's like a maybe and sort of like i hear them saying yes and or maybe to what you're saying which is like to include the consciousness of your soul maybe without the ego but the consciousness of your soul in this form is accessible to all versions of you in all multi-dimensional spaces and all universes the consciousness it's not exactly like your your cellular memory is, is obsolete outside of this form which i think you and i agree on but the ego the ego is a reflection of our reptilian brain in this in in this body on this planet so yes we are devoid of ego right all right cool so that's it you know we we've talked about processing abrupt loss so we're going to end the show a little abrupt and leave you hanging here okay. because there's going to be another one coming i'm sure candace this has been fantastic i appreciate you so much you do your monthly Akashic Records monthly predictions at the beginning of the month. Next one will be at the time of this recording, May. And how can people connect with you, hear about that and all the good things? Yeah, thank you so much, Sam. Yeah, I love going down a rabbit hole with you and it's, it feels really juicy and it feeds my soul as well. You know, it's not like regular water cooler conversation and I, I dig it. If you want to stay connected to my work, you can follow me, you know, IG, Facebook, Rasa Healing. I also have an awesome Mighty Network, Rasa Healing Network. 
where I host, you know, groups, events, courses. I teach the Akashic Record. I do the free monthly predictions. And right now I'm really focused on building community through the group that Sam is in, the Healing Collective, which is a small, intimate, engaged container to do self-work. It's a three-month group. So I'm, we're actually going to be having new spots come in May of 2023. And every three months we'll have more spots. So if you're interested in joining me for these sorts of discussions, but in a much more sort of emotional, deep dive, personal way, like that group would be really awesome engagement. And I highly recommend because I'm in it. So thank you so much, Candice. Appreciate you making the time and sharing your wisdom. Yeah, thank you.